a couple of introductory remarks. Um, since um, uh, 2018, University of Bonn uh, pools expertise in sustainability research across faculties in the transdisciplinary research area, innovation and technology for sustainable futures, called the TRA, um, transdisciplinary research area. We organize lecture series such as this one, Innovation Pathways to Sustainability, uh, to serve as a forum for high profile and internationally visible scientists who um, uh, we welcome. Today's lecture uh, will be given by Professor Katrin Böning Gese. Welcome, Professor Böning Gese. She has been a director of the Senckenberg Biodiversity and Climate Research Center and professor at Goethe University Frankfurt since 2010. Previously, you held a professorship at University of Mainz, and um, you are a trained biologist focused on the effects of climate and land use change on biodiversity, as well as on importance of biodiversity for human well being. So, that is inter and transdisciplinary. She um, is or was a speaker of the, no, she is a speaker of the DFG, DFG funded research unit, the role of nature for human well being in the Kilimanjaro social ecological system, um, which brings you also close to our agenda here in CEF. Uh, we do quite a bit of work in Africa and in East Africa. There is a, a Schwerpunkt program on. Uh, um, Futures Africa. Professor Böning Gese is a member of the German National Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina, and the Academy of Science and Literature of uh, Mainz University. She was uh, vice president of the Leibniz Association uh, until 2021. And in 2021, she was awarded the most distinguished German environmental award for her outstanding research and her commitment at the interface between science, society, and politics, the, the Deutsche Umweltpreis. Um, I know that um, um, Professor Böning Gese um, doesn't shy away from uh, challenging topics. So she has uh, recently convinced Martin Keim and me to join a working group which she is chairing, which she initiated a Leopoldina working group um, on biodiversity and trade. Um, so um, um, uh, thank you for keeping us busy. Um, Martin is traveling, I believe, today, um, but we are committed followers in your uh, Leopoldina working group. I now would like to ask you to give your uh, lecture on biodiversity and people in the Anthropocene. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor von Braun, for this very kind, very friendly introduction. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here and to talk about biodiversity and people. The issue that I'm addressing is well aware to everybody who is listening here and in Zoom. We have the great acceleration since about the 1950s, um, a steep increase in many socioeconomic indicators, in Earth system indicators, and the question, are there planetary boundaries? What are planetary boundaries? How do we measure them? And the idea is that our resources on the planet are obviously limited. So there have been attempts to calculate this tipping points for the Earth system for different sectors, ranging from climate change to biodiversity. And in this um, more recent publication by Stefan and his team, they uh, shed a light on the importance of biodiversity and biosphere integrity, pointing out that for genetic diversity, there's indication that we have already overstepped 
potential planetary boundaries, but for functional biodiversity, there are still a lot of unknowns so that such planetary boundaries could not be calculated. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is biodiversity, its impact for ecosystem functioning and its impact on people. Just a short reminder, what is biological diversity? It's the diversity of all living, of all life on earth, ranging from the diversity of species to the diversity within species and the diversity of landscapes. And we know since a couple of decades that various measures, indicators for biodiversity show steep declines. We don't have the nice indicators that the climate change community has, but the indicators we do have shed a light on different aspects of biodiversity. For example, to the left and above the living planet index, it's measuring the abundances of animals and mostly animals, mostly vertebrates, mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, and their change in populations over the past uh, 40 or so years with a steep decline. Then we have the red list index, upper row in the middle, which is measuring the threat of species decline. And for plants, we have no good indicators. We don't even know the tree species that exist on earth. So the simple indicator is just measuring forest extent with steep declines. When we are looking at species diversity, we do have some better indicators that are here published again by IPIS. That's the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the World Biodiversity Council, which is the equivalent to the World Climate Council, IPCC. And in their first global assessment, 2019, they showed this graph in red are the threatened species within different taxonomic groups, ranging from bony fishes and gastropods all the way to amphibians and cycads. And overall, IBIS calculated that 1 million species out of the about 8 million species on Earth is threatened by extinction. And extinction rates are now 10 to 100 times minimum higher than during the past 10 million years. So we are heading in the sixth mass extinction on Earth with the previous one, the fifth being caused by a meteorite and now this one by humans. The group that is most threatened by the way is a plant group, the cycads, mostly distributed on the Southern hemisphere. And this group has survived three of the five mass extinctions and is now threatened in, in this one. When we are looking closer to home, changes in Central Europe and uh, Germany are mostly driven by agricultural intensification. We see this if we look at birds and other groups in agricultural landscapes. So that's fields, meadows, and other grassland. And this indicator is measuring bird abundances of farmland birds in the brown line with declines of more than 30% in the past 25 years, whereas other groups like the forest birds in blue are more or less stable. So that's a strong indication that the problem lies somewhere in the agricultural landscape. Now, how do we go about it? This is a framework developed by IPIS, again, this World Biodiversity Council, which catches the different aspects that I'm looking here in my lecture, but also that have been or are currently studied very much in the global biodiversity community. So it goes like this. We have biodiversity at the bottom here, um, nature, and it's envisioned with different perspectives. Biodiversity in ecosystems in green is basically our Western science approach, whereas Mother Earth is uh, basically capturing alternative approaches to the same entity, nature. And the, what is driving biodiversity is shown here to the right-hand side, the direct drivers, natural drivers and anthropogenic drivers that are influencing biodiversity. And then biodiversity having an impact on nature's benefit to people, on nature's contribution to people, 
delineated either as ecosystem goods and services or as nature's gifts, depending on perspective. And this has then impact on the quality of life, human well-being, or living in harmony with nature. And in the core of this framework, we have anthropogenic assets and institutions and governance, which can be used to shape this relationship and basically develop things to the better. Now, first, regarding the drivers of biodiversity loss. Main driver of biodiversity loss is changes in land use and seas Sea use basically connected mostly with agriculture, deforestation in the tropics, and here in Central Europe, intense agriculture. We have a second most important factor exploitation of species in the marine system, mostly uh, catching fish and other resources, but also on land bushmeat hunting, followed by climate change, which is at the moment, not yet very important, with exception of corals, but which is um, prospected to be very important in the future. We have pollution and we have invasive species. Just some slight in, um, pictures into how these different factors drive changes in communities. Here, a result that might be not that, that much known is the impact of land use change on movements of animals. That's an analysis where about 800 individuals from close to 60 species have been tracked with such colors and their movement patterns have been followed and the distance of the movement stretches have been put in relationship to the human footprint measured with a human foot, uh, footprint index. And you see here with increasing human footprint, the distance that animals move declines steeply. So there's a general loss of fragility caused both by behavioral changes of the animals, they don't move around that much, and by a turnover in the communities with species with large territories dropping out. Then there is obviously the impact of climate change. Here I'm showing some results we've um, analyzed together with 27 institutions who have collected long-term data on this variety of groups from the marine realm through the freshwater system up to the terrestrial realm, looking at about a thousand such population dynamics from 22 different taxonomic groups with the result that we have a turnover in our communities with an decrease in cold adapted species and an increase in warm adapted species. Now, how are then the two factors, land use change and climate change, are impacting ecosystem functioning? And that's uh, basically one of the big results that came out of the first research unit on Kilimanjaro, where we studied biodiversity and ecosystem functioning along both an elevational gradient, which is giving us a climatic gradient, and along a disturbance gradient, a human land use gradient. So we have on Kilimanjaro a diversity of different ecosystem types. Here was little disturbance from the bottom, savanna, the tropical forests, up to Erika and Heligrysum shrub in the natural setting. And from the left to the right, a gradient of increasing human land use from little hues through these chaka home gardens, agroforestry plantations, all the way to coffee plantations with and without shade trees. So we have these two perpendicular gradients, which allow us to disentangle statistically the effect of those two drivers. And here is the result looking at 30 different ecosystem functions, ranging, for example, from soil organic carbon, soil pH, all the way to bed foraging or mammal biomass. And here in these individual figures, we always have an elevational gradient from low to high. And then in two different colors, the patterns without human land use and with human land use. And wherever you see a color here, we have an interaction effect between climate, which is basically um, the elevational gradient and land use. And the result of this big statistical analysis was that the effects of climate and land use enhance each other. So they are not additive, they are multiplicative. 
which means that the negative effect of land use on ecosystem functions is most severe under hot and arid conditions, under extreme climatic conditions. So, so far on the drivers of biodiversity loss and change, now looking at nature's benefits to people. That is basically a new framing of the old ecosystem service concept with, with a more contextualized um, framing and more, uh, more um, emphasis on cultural aspects of nature's contributions to people. Nevertheless, there's still the distinction between regulating NCPs, which is pollination and seed dispersal and decomposition and also effects of forests on control of climate and on um, erosion and so on. Then we have material NCPs, which is the products and services we directly derive from nature, like fish or timber or food or medical plants. And we have the non-material NCPs, which is all the non-material benefits we derive from nature, for example, recreation, impacts on health, the beauty of nature, the um, sense of place, the identity we derive from nature, Heimat, and for many of us also spiritual uh, enrichment of, of our encounters with nature. And again, Ibis tried to assess the changes in these various 18 NCPs with basically declines in almost all of them in the past 50 years, with the exception of three material NCPs, such as food or energy. Basically, ecosystems are optimized for production for material NCPs at the cost of regulating and non-material NCPs. To give some insight into the importance of these NCPs, I show some examples from my own research on birds. They are usually seen as beautiful creatures, but perhaps not very useful creatures. And I would like to convince you of the opposite. So an example of, of the importance of birds for material nature's contribution to people and their effect on pest control. We studied the impact of birds and bats on coffee yield, basically by enclosing coffee bushes in, on Kilimanjaro with such nets, um, basically preventing the access of birds and bats, and then looking at herbivory on the leaves and on fruit set, which is yield. And the result is that in we basically used did this in different three different settings: agroforestry, shade, and sun coffee plantations. And the dark bars show the yield under the presence of birds with pest control of birds and bats. And there is a significant effect of pest control by birds and bats on yield with the other group that we studied, uh, pollinators having an effect on coffee quality. The most important effect birds have on ecosystems is probably their effect as seed dispersers. That's particularly important in the tropics, where in tropical forests, 90-95% of the tree species have such beautiful fruits adapted to seed dispersal by vertebrates, mostly by birds. The problem, however, is that if we look at this relationship between birds and also mammals in the system and trees, the system is very much um, basically entangled. This is an interaction network from Kagamega Forest in um, Kenya, where 81 different animal species, mostly birds, interacted with 30 different tree species. And you see a lot of redundancy in the system. And the question is, does it matter if some of these 81 species go extinct? Does this really have an effect on ecosystem functioning? And this here is a meta-analysis of all the studies that have been conducted on some kinds of forest disturbance on plant reprodu reproduction. We looked at forest fragmentation, forest disturbance, including fu fu uh, bushmeat hunting, on basically the life cycle of a tree, starting with pollination, seed dispersal, seed predation, and seedling recruitment. And basically, over a study of 109 case studies and 176 woody plant species, we looked at which level 
of um, this plant reproductive cytial, the negative of, uh, effect of forest disturbance occurs. And here the result of this meta-analysis, we see negative effects of forest disturbance on pollination and on seed dispersal, but not on predation and recruitment. So the, the two interactions that rely on animals, pollination and seed dispersal are negatively affected by disturbance. So there is an effect in spite of all the redundancy. Now, how do we now identify the importance of the different species? And we are now basically at the point where we do have a breakthrough in un our understanding of the functional importance, at least for such groups as the birds. In the meantime, actually just a couple of weeks ago, the first database on six ecological and 11 functional traits of birds has been published with more than 90,000 measured individuals and basically all more than 11,000 species on earth come with data from hundreds of collections from 181 countries. And these functional traits were just measured as ecomorphological traits of, for example, the wing and the beak. And this can be now used to basically get a first understanding of the functional roles of the different species. And we are looking here on the right hand side on an frugivore community in the Andes. That's supposedly the most species rich um, frugivore community of birds that one can imagine. And um, basically, you take all these functional traits and to, to place them in a functional space. And the axes show the large parts of variation. And you see that many birds are clustered here in this corner. That's birds that have a similar body bow plan and probably a similar functional role. That's many of these small tenatures. They are probably rather redundant. But you see that they are exceptional species. There's no redundancy that are unique, like this tuca net with a large beak able to disperse large seeds or the aras in this corner. So we can show which species are unique with often a, a particularly important role in seed dispersal. Um, and we then can look at the importance in the ecosystem. And this leads me to a bit of another question. How do now trees cope with land use and climate change? How does seed dispersal happen in a fragmented landscape? We are here again in Africa, in South Africa, here in the province KwaZulu-Natal, and these tiny patches are the last remnants of in, uh, indigenous forests here in this province. And this is a global hotspot of tree diversity. So the question is with climate change, how do the trees move from forest fragment to forest fragment if they want to follow their climatic niche towards the south? And to find out how this might happen, we put radio transmitters on the largest frugivore we have in Southern Africa, that's the trumpeter hornbill. And these devices here take the position of the bird every 15 minutes. And with this, we can basically delineate the behavior of these birds also across large spatial scales. And this is one day in the life of hornbill, Bill. And he started out in the gorge, Oribe Gorge Nature Reserve. And in the morning, he left um, the gorge and flew into the agricultural landscape and did a little stop here in one fig tree to sample if the figs are ripe. And then through the sugar play, um, cane plantation is flying to a little forest fragment where he is spending about an hour, an hour and a half. Then he is turning and spending some time here in this homestead of a farmer. And then he is uh, flying again to the next fragment where he is uh, staying maybe two hours and then again going to a homestead. And the South African farmers, they plant in their gardens fruit bearing trees because when they are sitting on their porch in the afternoon having their tea, they love to observe the birds in these trees. And the birds know this. And in the afternoon, the bird is flying back through some stepping stones and is spending again the night here in the gorge. And with this data for 33 home um, hornbills, 
we are now able to basically delineate the potential seed dispersal processes that these birds can provide. And that's a map of the area. Down here, we have um, the Indian Ocean. The dark patches are the forest fragments. The red lines are potential seed dispersal events. And you, show, um, you see that these hornbills connect these patches and they basically enable a functional connectivity of these landscapes. And finally, looking at birds and their contribution to non-material NCP, what we studied here is the relationship between bird diversity and human well-being, measured through the European Quality of Life Survey, where about 38,000 Europeans are asked every couple of years 200 different questions. And one question they are asked is, how satisfied are you with your life in general? scale one to 10. And you see here that people in Scandinavia are rather happy and people here in Southeast Europe are not so happy. And then related with this traditional happiness or well-being index, all kinds of different variables, starting with income and family situation, but also natural indicators like bird diversity. And we found in a big statistical analysis a significant relationship between bird species richness and life satisfaction of the basically questioned people. So the persons that live in an environment with a high bird diversity are on average more content with their life um, than people that are living in a corporate environment. And this is significant regardless of the different countries. Now, the relationship doesn't look very strong, but in fact, it is very strong. It is basically at the same um, steepness in gradient as income. If you increase bird species richness by 10%, life satisfaction is increasing to the same degree as if you increase income by 10%. So there's a really strong relationship that probably most of us aren't really aware of. So birds are important. They have important ecosystem functions. And to basically finish this part of the talk, declines in biodiversity have been shown to undermine, in general, the progress towards the sustainability developmental goals, reaching from no poverty to life on land. Basically, the loss of biodiversity and nature's contribution to people also undermines um, reaching the SDGs. So obviously there is time for action and it's necessary to do something about this. And again, coming back to this framework, it's obvious that we need to do something here at the central part, human assets and institutions and governance and other indirect drivers. Now, the first thing that what needs to do obviously is to do more research on these complex relationships and in our research unit that um, Professor von Braun already mentioned, the role of nature for human well being, Kilimanjaro is a social ecological system. We use this IPIS framework and implement it on this mountain. We have seven different sub projects where we basically look at these interactions between biodiversity, nature's contribution to people, human well being, governance and societal change, including land use, management, and conservation. We have just started, so I cannot tell you any results yet, besides that it is an interesting challenge to bring the natural scientists and the social scientists together, but we are on a good way, I think. Second, we are now in the position, in the lucky position, like the climate change community, that we have now future scenarios on biodiversity. So the idea is to bend the curve. This is the change in biodiversity over time up to now. This is basically the decline we have seen, for example, in the Living Planet Index. And in this model, uh, researchers around Leclerc of IASA have taken different approaches using different future scenarios. And I will show only two, the two most extreme one, one is the black scenario doing nothing, business as usual. Then it's envisioned that biodiversity will further steeply decline up to the year 2100. 
Alternative is the yellow scenario where we basically can bend the curve in the year 2030 and have an increase in biodiversity again at the, in the year 2050. And to achieve this, we need to take three different measures. First, we need to act on the conservation side, C. We need larger and better managed protected areas and restoration. Then we need to act on the supply side. We need to increase productivity in countries where we have yield gaps. This model also assumes poor trade. And we need to act on the demand side, for example, with lower, less food waste and more plant-based human diets. And if we basically use all three measures, that's the yellow line, we can bend the curve. What can we do concretely? Now, Germany is very active with a huge initiative of increasing protected areas globally, especially in the global south. That's the legacy landscape approach, which is financed mostly by the BMZ. The idea is to find the areas on Earth, large areas, more than 2,000 square kilometers, with high biodiversity, high ecosystem integrity, and high stability under climate change, various other measures. The funding is in unique in that the idea is to have um, trust funds financed through private public partnerships, which is then putting out 1 million per legacy landscape per year. And we have obviously long term governance approaches with the collaboration of governmental and non-governmental organizations and local communities. Our role at Senckenberg has been to advise on the selection of these sites. So we are finding ourselves as macroecologists in the unique position of basically having the earth in front of us and making decisions or supporting decision-making on which are the most valuable areas on earth. And we started out with all World Heritage Sites, key biodiversity areas, and IUCN protected areas one and two, the ones that are larger than 2,000 square kilometers, which gives us more than 1,300 sites that are potentially um, possible as legacy landscapes. And then he, we used all the different macroecological layers that are available. For example, here, the map of species richness of birds, but also of mammals, amphibians, reptiles, endemic species, phylogenetic diversity. And we used the various measures of human footprint. For example, here, the biodiversity intactness index, which delineates the wilderness areas. And you see here immediately that there's a mismatch, whereas most, I'm going back, um, species rich areas are found here in the tropics, for example, in tropical, especially in tropical mountain areas. The big wilderness areas lie also in the tropics, but also in the very north. So it obviously depends very much on our conservation objectives, which sites are the best. And this is basically the best um, five areas per um, biogeographic realm if we use different indicators. Green, the best sites under biodiversity protection, red under high ecosystem integrity, and gray a combination 50-50 by the two. And you see different areas pop out depending on our specific conservation objectives. And this approach has been proven successful. There are now seven legacy landscapes that are basically in the process of being implemented. Now, the second approach is to improve the situation for the agricultural areas in Germany. That is the result of a joint statement we did across the German academies, which was, by the way, also published in the meantime in Trends in Ecology and Evolution. So also this was just an assessment. It was picked up also by a very uh, high reputation journal in the field of ecology and evolution. And the result is, and I'm telling you here nothing new, is that we need a, um, basically a holistic approach to tackle this problem. We need, obviously, to change our agricultural practices, more organic ag agriculture, or more biological pest control, or more structural diversity. 
but obviously this is not sufficient. We also need to change our agricultural policies, starting with a common agricultural policy, but also our landscape management. We need changes in industry and technology like breeding of disease resistant drought tolerant varieties, basically all framed under the term Agrarwende. But as you know that um, many of these resistant breeds and also many of the organic farming has lower productivity. So we need to have a sustainable relationship in these agricultural landscapes, it's not sufficient to have an Agrarwende, we need societal transformations. Basically affecting also trades and markets, the civic society, for example, the societal awareness of the values of biodiversity, lower meat consumption and less food waste. Again, this study, although it was published quite late in the debate, also had quite an impact. It was picked up by the Zukunftskommission Landwirtschaft by Strohschneider and was made basically the basic of um, the discursive process that was started there with basically the agricultural um, um, Verbände, um, yeah. Well, on the one hand side and the nature, uh, nature conservation on the other side, and Strohschneider was able to bring them into a compromise and to have a joint statement that they are now basically pressing into politics and trying to um, implement. And the second, um, perhaps even more surprising output was that this study was picked up by Rezo, you know, this blue haired blogger who publishes videos that uh, have the name Zerstörung der CDU. So this study was picked up there. He was referring to the scientists as boys and girls, and it reaches more than 8 million people. And I was contacted by, the nef by a nephew of 15 years old who saw this video and, and said, well, that's interesting stuff that you are doing there. So you have an outreach that was not really expected. So to summarize here, I hope I have convinced you that biodiversity is at least as important as secure, securing food and the climate crisis. And that is basically one of the three major crises um, we are tackling with and that are obviously closely connected. But biodiversity should not stay basically on the margin of attention. It needs to be placed as the other crisis in the center of intention. And we need to be aware that is one of the core crises that is threatening the very existence of human well-being and that it needs to be at the core of societal and political decision making. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Katrin Böning-Gese, for this inspiring talk. Uh, we now have to bring together our audience from Zoom and in the room uh, for our question and answer session. Uh, so colleagues in Zoom, you can, of course, raise your hand and ask your question yourself. You can also type it into the chat, which you are monitoring. And I'm also looking around here in the room, whether there's anyone interested in asking a question. If not, I'll uh, start and, oh, there's one. Okay, go ahead, please. Das ist okay. Vielleicht drücken Sie einmal auf den, genau, fragen Sie auf Deutsch. Ja. Also, ich bin ja hier, um zu sehen, also mein Name ist Keller, ich bin vom BMW. Und Und nochmal, danke. Und ähm, wissen Sie, was Sie da ausdrücken, war schön, plausibel, nachvollziehbar. Sie haben gute Beispiele gebracht. Nur die gibt es aber mittlerweile zuhauf, wie wichtig die Biodiversität ist. Das ist nichts Neues. Die Frage ist nur, wie wir als Mensch damit umgehen. 
Und da bin ich nicht so optimistisch wie Sie, einfach nur zu fordern, was besser laufen muss. Das funktioniert nicht. Ich nenne Ihnen ein Beispiel, die europäische Wasserrahmenrichtlinie. Vielleicht ist Ihnen die geläufig. Das ist eine europäische Richtlinie, die dazu führen soll, dass die ökologische Qualität von Fies und Fiesgewässer und Schienegewässer bis äh, eigentlich 2015, jetzt verlängert auf 2027, sich in einen guten ökologischen Zustand verwandelt. Das geschieht überhaupt nicht. Wir haben gerade mal 10 Prozent der Fiesgewässer in einem guten Zustand. Und die Politik macht eigentlich nichts. Ja, nichts. Im Gegenteil, sie versucht eben diese eigentlich gute Richtlinie, wo es eigentlich mehr darum geht, den ökologischen Zustand zu beschreiben, zunichte. Also, da müssen sie ein bisschen härter auftreten, wenn sie was mit ihren Zielen erreichen wollen. So läuft das gar nicht. Ja, yeah, thank you for this, um, this point. I'm, uh, I'm asking uh, in English. Um, I realize that this is a core problem. And obviously, as a scientist, I need to act differently to an NGO. NGOs uh, have uh, the possibility to use different measures. I need to convince with scientific arguments. And as a scientist, looking back now, the more than 30 years I'm doing science, I agree that things are going downhill, but I also see signs that things are changing. And um, there's, for example, the European Biodiversity um, Directive, which has been published last year, and it is quite ambitious. And it is uh, to a degree ambitious. I haven't seen over the last 30 years. And I also see signs in po German politics to take up these uh, things and to take it seriously. And uh, I see signs in changing public perception. It is still small seedlings that are growing, but more than nothing. And as a scientist, my job is to nurture these seedlings. Thank you for an inspiring lecture. Um, I have um, a two-sided question. Uh, one is, um, how do you assess the farm to fork strategy of the European Union, which has um, um, a motivation behind some of the measures of land use change uh, and agronomic practices that are driven by the loss of species? The flip side of my question relates to your research at Kilimanjaro. Um, how do you engage uh, land users? You, you briefly hinted at it, land users there, and the economic constraints under which they are operating, especially also smallholder farmers. How do you engage them from a biodiversity protection um, perspective? So here, Europe, there, Africa, you work at both. Um, uh, so um, before you answer, let me just uh, emphasize, I completely believe in the correlation between human well-being and, and bird density as a bird watcher. Uh, but um, uh, I would like to see a bit more causality analysis rather than correlation there. Maybe you can later on come to that as well. Thank you. Um, it is a, a, a huge trade-off. Um, we have this trilemma the WGBU said on uh, either biodiversity protection or food security or climate protection all taking place in a, uh, on land and in a competitive situation. So um, I think the farm to fork directive is very strong if we actually are able to, to implement them. If it's implemented, that would be a huge step forward to biodiversity in the agricultural sector. So I envision if there's really 30% organic farming in Germany or in Europe overall, that all these, um, these agricultural birds and the insects are recovering again and that we can bend the curve in, in the agricultural uh, sector or in the, on agricultural land here in, in Central Europe. Um, it's obvious that um, in, in a country like Tanzania, we have huge increases in human population. These Chaka home gardens, which are on the lower forest belt of Kilimanjaro, are a surprisingly stable system. Biodiversity is surprisingly high. Bird and um, 
um, bird diversity, bed diversity, other groups are almost as diverse as in the neighboring forest. And the land use is very sustainable. We have no loss of nitrogen from the soils and so on. So um, the problem occurs on Kilimanjaro that with increasing populations, the people are settling on the in the savanna belt, um, which is too dry and um, and um, affords only maize, uh, uh, and the maize is looking really poor. So um, that's where the challenge is outside the national park at the at bottom of the mountain. At the moment, I cannot tell you what the solution is. Um, we haven't done, uh, we have just started with these um, entangled uh, research on humans and people. But um, if I expand the ideas of the V, GBU is looking for win-win-win situ situation. So if a land use system like the Chaka home gardens can be seen as a, as an, uh, a vision of how biodiversity and people can coexist, that might, um, it's probably not working in the arid landscape of the savannah, but at least to look for win-win-win solutions. And with the bird diversity, it's true that there's so far only a correlation, and it might be caused by uh, birds singing and people enjoying this, even if they don't know the birds, or if alternative explanation is that birds are indicators of diverse and healthy landscapes, and that the birds and the humans are equally happy in this kind of landscape. But it's absolutely true that we need to understand the mechanisms and their um, Medicine has to come in in psychology to, to really look at the mechanistic relationship. And we are dearly waiting for a BMBF call, which allows us uh, to study, which is about to come this summer, uh, the relationship between biodiversity and health. Yeah. Um Thanks a lot for your really excellent talk. Um, I'm Tina Beuchelt. I'm a senior researcher here um, at CEF at the Department for Ecology and Natural Resources. Um, I appreciated that you highly pointed out the, the biodiversity crisis and the need for societal um, transformation. And um, in, in reply to his uh, question, you pointed out also the role of scientists. And that is where, where I'm currently struggling with what, what I know the past role or the current role where we say it's, it's publications, it's research, it's science policy, um, communication, interaction, interaction also with the civil society. But looking at the problems, and you really pointed that out, I wonder, is that enough? Or do we as scientists have to think maybe of a new understanding of what's our role as a researcher, as a scientist in society, given the, the current multiple crises. So I, I'm, yeah, I, I would like to get your, your point here, like, and, and how could a new model look like? Do we have to engage more in an activism? Do we have to get engaged much more in communication? How could we actually really drive behavior change forward, even when we are not maybe social scientists or uh, but from other disciplines? Um. I firmly believe in the role of scientists as honest brokers, as uh, basically giving alternative um, pathways or different futures to, to society and politics for then society and politics to decide. It's not our role, I think, that we become activists. Um, nevertheless, our role, role in providing knowledge is, I think, extremely important. For example, this policy change in Bavaria um, the, the initiative um, um, Aktionsplan Bienen, that was successful. The activists from Bavaria say because there was scientific evidence that was the Krefeld study with this decline of insects and at the same time an emotional attachment of the people in Bavaria to biodiversity and for this reason 1.7 people voted for uh, opening this Volksbegehren which is the most successful folks began ever um, um, basically pulled and uh, it immediately changed the politics. So um, by providing scientific evidence, I think we are doing a very good role. And then I think not everybody, but everybody like, who likes to and feels um, enjoys this should engage in, in communication with both politicians and with the public, starting with lectures uh, in your village and town all the way to basically um, 
Jahres annual meetings of the Leopoldina where you reach a, a different community. And then uh, I also believe in the role of research museums like uh, Museum König or we have the Senckenberg Museum in, in Frankfurt, which are platforms for exchange with the public. People uh, come there with basically also an open mind and an open heart to be informed and to be engaged. And um, there it's very important that these museums open up to different societal groups, not only the well-intentioned, well-educated, but also different socioeconomic groups with special programs and perhaps also more outreach towards this part of, of our population. I would like to read a question that was posed in the chat by Georges Celade, who is a research group leader here at ZEF. Um, he says, thanks for your presentation and asks, um, uh, he thinks, uh, I think we and in brackets, economists, because he's an economist, quite often use deforestation or agrochemical use to proxy biodiversity loss, which might be poor indicators. What ecological aspects are we missing by using these proxies and what advice would you give to non-ecologists? Sort of the um, complementary question to this one, who might want to use better indicators to estimate causal effects of policies on biodiversity? That's a very difficult question because um, as a biodiversity community, we are not very good so far in providing indicators. So the, the one thing is to go out and measure the obvious suspects like bird diversity and, and um, um, butterfly diversity. And there's more and more tools available that are more um, um, that can be easier used like um, identification of birds uh, through inter uh, artificial intelligence or DNA um, analysis barcoding to uh, get at the soil um, fauna and, and, and these difficult animals. Um, alternatively, you can use these biodiversity maps that are available on threatened species and diversity overall, the maps that I've shown you on the extent of ecosystems. And then the focus should be especially on threatened species and protected areas, including also the key biodiversity areas that are already delineated where you can basically look if your business is affecting um, key BAs and protected areas and in particular threatened species. But I think that's something that needs to improve very quickly because um, this is a very important question that um, also with the new reporting duties that businesses in Europe will have uh, in a couple of years on their impact on biodiversity and ecosystems, we need to be able to deliver at least rough maps on, on biodiversity and ecosystems. Okay, uh, since I don't see any other hands, I'm gonna abuse my moderator power and ask a question myself. Um, one term that I didn't hear in your presentation, though I'm sure you have thought about it, is uh, tipping points in the context of biodiversity. The BMBF, which you also mentioned, recently discontinued a program uh, linked to biodiversity tipping points. Um, is it given the lack of data maybe too early to study those tipping points or should we worry about them? And if yes, what kind of research is needed to understand that better? Um, a very good and very difficult question. I think there are systems that where tipping points are obvious, but there's also a recent uh, analysis by Helmut Hillebrand and his team who analyzed many, many experiments and other studies looking at biodiversity gradients and looking at some kind of response of ecosystem functions and services, searching for tipping points. And the result of the study was that he couldn't find tipping points. There was rather a continuous decline in the function with biodiversity loss and degradation. So I'm wondering if in general, there might be the, the concept of tipping points that we adopted a bit from the climate community might not work as well for the biodiversity community. And that means also that there's no safe operating space in which we need to stay and be careful when we approach the tipping point that with every loss, we are losing function, which means that we shouldn't lose anything. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Yes, go ahead, please. No, so, so far not. My question goes um, uh, beyond biodiversity. Um, 
and relates to uh, genetic diversity within species. Um, um, and um, uh, we know that um, uh, genomics has, uh, has um, told us that there is diversity um, uh, among mammals uh, within the same species, but we also see this diversity among our agricultural crops. So um, uh, isn't it a challenge for biodiversity research uh, that we uh, typically stop at the uh, species or in agriculture at the land races um, and um, don't look into the great diversity within um, a, a species? Um, uh, among humans, we are interested, of course, in the Methuselah gene. Uh, some people grow old, others uh, don't. Um, and the same applies to um, uh, some animals and uh, some plants. They have uh, diversity within. So um, how do you feel about this challenge of defining um, the biodiversity versus genetic information uh, diversity, um, in, including inside species? I'm um, 100% d'accord, it is very important. And um, I think the reason why we studied mostly species diversity and not genetic diversity or within species diversity is lack of data. And landscape diversity is difficult because it's so difficult to measure. You need units to calculate something like landscape diversity. And if you don't have natural units, which you have for species, it's difficult. So in general, it would be extremely important uh, to have such data. And I think it's particularly uh, important for these agricultural species. What, we, what I'm worried about, if we, and there has been a movement on essential biodiversity variables, making lists of what we need to know. And the list was growing and growing and growing. And within species diversity was obviously an important factor. But if we are thinking so much about this, it delays also a bit coming up with solutions. And if we look at these big maps we have right now, when a company needs to assess its impact, for example, in the global south, you can have only these simple relationships uh, with, uh, go through the value chain and then know in which country they are doing business and perhaps some change in um, biodiversity envisioned and related to the land use there. So even at the most and the best known groups, the vertebrates, especially the birds, it's almost impossible to tell the, the, the footprint of a com company. And then waiting for genetic information to be available. I think we need solutions quickly and then in this simultaneously improve the data situation. And in general, if we look at these global maps, where we do have data on genetic diversity, they seem to correlate with species diversity to a reasonable degree. So these areas in the Andes or in the southern part of the Himalaya, they are also where we have the highest within species diversity. Whereas here, where we have um, a poor species diversity, we have also poor genetic diversity in most taxa. So there is a very rough correlation between the two. And I would for the time being, look at such umbrella terms like bird diversity, under which uh, many other things are reasonably um, basically um, aligned. Um, I dare to ask another question, which is linked to one bullet point I saw on one of your slides where you mention the potential of robotics and digitalization in agriculture. At University of Bonn, as you probably know, we have a cluster that looks into the development of, of robotics technology, not just robotics, but also the phenotyping and sensing around robotics. And um, of course, uh, we do have the hypothesis that this can also contribute to um, improving agrobiodiversity. Um, <clears throat> how much potential do you see in, in, in doing these kinds of measures, trying to change the way agriculture is done, as opposed to actually conserving the remaining natural elements and landscapes and, and trying to make sure those remain in place or, or, or is it not possible to balance the two? Um, well, with the land sharing, land sparing debate, 
I firmly believe we need both, especially when, um, or for example, if, if we look in, in Germany, if we had a land sharing approach, we wouldn't have any forests and we wouldn't have any highly productive landscapes, but very nice cultural landscapes all over the place. If we use a land sparing approach, we would have forest and highly productive agricultural <laughs> landscapes, but we wouldn't have any skylarks anymore because they are found mostly in, in um, in uh, areas with uh, less intensive agriculture. So I think we need everything. And with the uh, robotics and uh, digitalization, that's not really my field. So I can not really say how much potential there is. What I observe is that in theory, there is a high potential. One can plant completely different kinds of agricultural and agricultural landscape. And if they are heterogeneous, diverse, and uh, even mixtures of different crops, I would uh, argue that this is connected with a higher species diversity as well. So there should be an improvement. I think most of these people don't really think in this kind of value system. And when they develop robotics approaches, they think of something else, but not on, uh, improving biodiversity. So again, it's a measure of awareness raising and basically putting this as one of the objectives of what this um, transformation in, in agriculture should achieve. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I see two hands. I don't know who was first. Um, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, um, offensichtlich wird die Wissenschaft von der Politik nicht ernst genommen. Nehmen wir mal das Beispiel der Krefelder Studie. Da wurde ja festgestellt, dass die Biomasse der Insekten in Naturschutzgebieten um 80 Prozent zurückgegangen ist. So, das weiß jeder eigentlich. Ne? Was passiert in Naturschutzgebieten in Deutschland, in Nordrhein-Westfalen und in, in FFH-Schutzgebieten darf weiterhin betrieben werden, die Landwirtschaft darf weiterhin gedüngt werden und gespritzt werden. Und es gibt auch keine Pufferzone entlang der Grenzen von Naturschutzgebieten, was es anbetrifft die Landwirtschaft. Da passiert gar nichts. Sehen Sie, da, da können Sie äh, Veröffentlichungen machen und Studien machen. Sie sehen ja, es passiert nichts. Jetzt haben wir in Nordrhein-Westfalen eine neue Landesregierung, Schwarz-Grün. Im Koalitionsvertrag steht auch nichts drin. Da wird auch nichts kommen. Es ist weiterhin Business as usual betrieben. Wie wollen Sie, wenn Sie wirklich engagiert sind für eine bessere Welt, wie wollen Sie da irgendwas ändern wollen, außer hinter dem Katheter zu stehen? Also das ist zu wenig. It is a, a big challenge. I do not deny, it, deny this. It's, it's absolutely um, critical and extremely difficult. Again, I point out signs of, of hope. It is in the Koalitionsvertrag on the Bundesebene, basically to, to um, have 30% uh, um, organic agriculture in, in Germany that would make a difference. And then it depends obviously also on, on the individual federal states, how they delineate this. I see positive developments in Bavaria and in Baden-Württemberg, maybe not here in Rhein, uh, not Rhein-Westfalen, but um, it, um, it, the Krefelder Studie has changed a lot. It has placed um, biodiversity much more in the center of political attention. It's right now obviously um, basically crowded out again by the Ukraine war and by the need for food security. But I mean, the bad thing and the good thing is that this crisis don't go away by not dealing with it. So I'm sure that it will basically come back into the center of attention. And then it should, uh, I would envision that it's more prominent also in the Koalitionsverträge of the federal states. Um, I, I have a different question um, because I learned something new. I, I, I thought, I mean, there's, there is a diversity in landscapes, but today you pointed out actually biodiversity is also biodiversity, not only in plant and animal species, but also in landscapes. And then I, I'm just wondering, could you elaborate more on that concept? Because I, I, I just try to imagine how do you measure that? Like at which scales can we say there is a decline in landscapes or maybe an increase? I was wondering when we cut down forest, is that now 
replacing one landscape with another one or, or how, how, how do you deal with it? I find it absolutely fascinating. <laughs> well, it is the, the definition of the CBD on the Convention on Biological Diversity, which defines biodiversity also as the diversity of landscapes. But you, if you look in the, in the papers, uh, also of the IPES in the Governmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Service, it's hardly mentioned because I think of this problem. And what I, at least, what, what one can envision is that um, structurally rich landscape, like the cultural landscapes we have in some parts of Germany with a mixture of forests and hedgerows and heterogeneous crops and a small scale agriculture that feels more like a diverse landscape than a huge monotonous landscape. And um, we know that these kinds of landscapes have also a higher species diversity. And we see the same in, in tropical agricultural systems. There are also traditional agricultural systems like the Chaga home gardens with high biodiversity and monocultures with low diversity. It's uh, not a terribly useful uh, term, I think. Okay, I would like to read one more question from the chat and then I would propose to close the question list unless there's uh, one very urgent request for a question. Uh, Felipe Quattucci, thanks for your presentation. What is the relation between carbon stocks and biodiversity? In case of land restoration, can we rely on the carbon stock as an indicative of restoration success, excluding here monoculture or culture plantations? Um, but if we uh, look across the earth, there is, if we look at carbon stocks and biodiversity, there is in general a positive correlation that many of the species rich systems in tropical forests are also very rich in carbon. There's also um, <coughs> systems that are rich in carbon and not rich in biodiversity and the other way around. So there's no simple one to one relationship. So. I think I wouldn't rely too much on carbon stocks and um, also the whole discussion now mentioned for climate change and carbon offsetting and so on, it, it bears the, the danger of focusing too exclusively on climate mitigation. Um, it's especially visible in these uh, bioenergy plant um, initiatives, which obviously um, have a benefit for uh, climate but are terribly bad for, for biodiversity, especially if they are planted palm oil plantations in, in biodiverse, uh, rich tropical regions. So I would try very hard to get biodiversity data to address this question. And at least at this rough level, where the maps that I've showed, these uh, data are available. So for these um, more than 1,300 um, potential um, legacy landscapes, we do have all these data on species diversity, carbon stocks, and so on. So you can go down to a resolution of about 50 by 50 kilometer, and at this scale, data would be available. Thank you very much. So I would propose that we close the session today. Kathleen bruning thank you very much for your very inspiring talk. I have learned a lot, um, including um, about what can be done uh, and that there is no one strategy, but actually multiple strategies that must be pursued at the same time. I also note that there's skepticism in the room about uh, how we should go about making ourselves heard. Um, science is one way. There are, of course, other ways. And all of us are not only scientists, but also private people who can do other things uh, when we are outside of our professional area. So I think we will all continue doing that and hopefully at some point convince decision makers that uh, they should adopt more of our recommendations. Uh, once again, thank you very much. I hope you can stay a bit longer for uh, a smaller round of discussions. And uh, thank you, everyone in Zoom. Thank you, everyone here in the room. And uh, hope to see you soon again in one of our lecture series. Thank you very much in the name of uh, the TRA6 team. Bye-bye.